Body Zero, Radical Preparation for the Return of Christ. Chapter Seven, Him. So if there's one passage of the Bible that I needed to go to, to say this is my favorite passage, I don't know what it would be for you, but for me it would be the 16th chapter of Ezekiel. I think there are, there are moments in, I don't know, the life of Joseph where he's reunited with his brothers or the back end of the Gospels, particularly during the Passion Week and John particularly, I think just, they're very moving. Ezekiel 16 for me in a sense probably trumps all of that. Let's just read it again. If you've got your Bible, it'd be great just to read along with me. So Ezekiel 16, 1, 3, 2, we'll see where we go. Again, the word of the Lord came to me, son of man, make known to Jerusalem her abominations and say, thus says the Lord God to Jerusalem, your origin and your birth are of the land of the Canaanites. Your father was an Amorite and your mother a Hittite. And as for your birth, on the day you were born, your cord was not cut, nor were you washed with water to cleanse you, nor rubbed with salt, nor wrapped in swaddling cloths. No eye pitied you to do any of these things to you out of compassion for you. But you were cast out on the open field for you were abhorred on the day that you were born. And when I passed by you and saw you wallowing in your blood, I said to you in your blood, live. I said to you in your blood, live. I made you flourish like a plant of the field and you grew up and became tall and arrived at full adornment. Your breasts were formed and your hair had grown, yet you were naked and bare. And when I passed by you again and saw you, behold, you were at the age for love. And I spread the corner of my garment over you and covered your nakedness. I made my vow to you and entered into a covenant with you, declares the Lord your God, and you became mine. Then I bathed you with water and washed off your blood from, your, from you and anointed you with oil. I clothed you also with embroidered cloth and shod you with fine leather. I wrapped you in fine linen and covered you with silk and I adorned you with ornaments and put bracelets on your wrists and a chain on your neck. And I put a ring on your nose and earrings in your ears and a beautiful crown on your head. Thus you were adorned with gold and silver and your clothing was of fine linen and silk and embroidered cloth. You ate fine flour and honey and oil you grew exceedingly beautiful and advanced to royalty and your renown went forth among the nations because of your beauty for it was perfect through the splendor that I had bestowed on you declares the Lord God and then in verse 15 it just starts off with the word but but you trusted in your beauty and played the whore Just to ask three questions really quickly, if you can imagine these three scenarios and just think to yourself, what would be the most painful of the three scenarios? Number one, that one of your friends, one of your closest friend, maybe even your best friend, betrayed you and slandered you online and um, wrote some stuff about you that was painful. Number two, that somebody you knew and loved became sick and passed away or number three that your husband or your wife cheated on you and everything that you knew of your marriage imploded and collapsed and your best friend the love of your life became an adulterer what of those three scenarios would be most painful and here's what seems obvious to me as an answer and this isn't to minimize in any way the pain of the other two scenarios one and two but there is something particularly painful and I think is that the absolute apex of the human heart's ability to absorb pain and that is around the whole issue of covenant and marriage there is nothing more painful than I can imagine than for marry my wife my beautiful stunning bride to leave me for another lover or another series of lovers, or for Mary to go into Edinburgh and set up a, a new brothel franchise. There would be nothing more painful if that was to if that happened, as unthinkable as that is, 
I would rather die, I would literally rather die. And in this chapter in Ezekiel 16, we talked earlier about divine pathos and that grace on the individual and on the church to empathise and suffer with just a little bit, just, a, just the smallest fraction of what it is in the heart of God for his people. This is the, if you like, the epicentre of the identity of the coming king. He's coming not as a, he's not coming as a, um, as a, a good teacher, he's not coming as a prophet only, he's coming specifically as a bridegroom king. You know, that's not a metaphor. He's not going to be a metaphoric bride, bridegroom. There's not going to be a metaphorical wedding supper of the Lamb. They will be literal. And so this is the centre, the absolute centre of the suffering heart of God for this, this kind of like, it's a blend of parental, but also um, romantic, um, brotherly, sisterly. There's a, it's kind of like a a montage of relationships here in this passage from Ezekiel where you see this baby being lifted from the, the grit and the dirt and the blood and the mess and being cleaned and being adorned with every conceivable blessing to grow up through puberty into this stunning bride who is then enters into this covenant, marriage covenant with her bridegroom. And then as we just saw in verse 15, who'd, she'd been in this place of death, no one had loved and no one had cared for and yet this bridegroom figure, this kind of parental, fatherly, godlike figure comes along and just prophesies and speaks live to the baby. And yet in verse 15, it paints this picture that I've just hypothetically painted of a bride leaving her bridegroom or of all the opposite way around, a marriage breaking down, the tragedy of covenantal breakdown. In verse 15 of Ezekiel 16, but you trusted in your beauty and you played the whore. And today in the church, in the state that the church is in, as, as we're seeing, confused and complicit in so many theological heresies, confusion, etc, etc, it's this, it's this analogy that runs in a sense throughout the whole Bible of spiritual adultery, spiritual unfaithfulness. And here in the kind of the middle of this unbelievable book, of Ezekiel get this kind of snapshot of into the heart of Jesus as the one who's going to come to redeem the bride just like Hosea and Gomer maybe talk about that another time the redeeming love of Father God who even in our own weakness even in our own unfaithfulness it says in Isaiah actually in another part that we're all prone to wander and turn to our own ways and yet Jesus still came and loved us and stooped and condescended to us Philippians 2 taking on the very nature of a servant and becoming obedient even to death, even death on the cross, there's the blood, and yet he speaks life to us. And that is the nature of this Jesus that we love and that we follow and that we today proclaim. This is the one who is worthy of our submission in all areas of life, just like any bride would submit to a bridegroom or vice versa. And so I'd encourage you just to dig into this. It's a, it's a deep, powerful passage of scripture and emphases running through, actually running through the whole of this book, Body Zero, is that Jesus is not, not a hippie coming on a My Little Pony. He's actually the coming bridegroom. Out of his mouth will come the sword of his word. His name is faithful and true, and he comes to make war. It's what it says in Revelation 19. He comes to make war on every enemy of God. And that is the kind of jealous love that we see in this chapter, the redeeming love that eventually will make every wayward heart faithful in the end. We will be found faithful, or at least five of the virgins will be found faithful and waiting for him. Father, thank you for your word again today. We thank you that you invite us to study your word and to go deep into your word and to reflect and to chew it over. Thank you for the way that you've spoken to each of us over our lives to in certain bits that we can point to and we just know that we've met with you in the pages of this book. And I pray especially for this bridal paradigm in this chapter. It really is who you are. It's your premier, it's your premier identity. It's you are the bridegroom, Jesus, and there's so much in that that we don't understand from a Jewish context, from an ancient 
Jewish context. And so I pray, Holy Spirit, particularly today for the UK church, not that we would be an echo of other ministries in other countries, but that you would reveal uniquely, in a sense, to the UK church what it means to anticipate the coming of the Bridegroom King. I pray particularly for men today, the most powerful men on the face of the planet are those who know you as the Bridegroom, who understand that your love, what it means to be, to have a husband in heaven, that transcends every other copy on earth to do with sexuality and whatever else. Lord, we just acknowledge you today as the one transcendent over everything that we know about love and romance and sex. And so, Lord, I pray for this emphasis again to be in the UK church unto your return. In Jesus' name.